right. So Dr. Brian Burge is an associate professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University. He's the author or well, co-author co-author of four books, including The Nuns, 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America, and The Great Church. He has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Politica. He's also appeared on 60 Minutes, where Anderson Cooper called him one of the leading data analysts of religion and politics in the United States. And this may be a first for this meeting. He's also uh, been a pastor of an American Baptist church for over 17 years. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Brunford. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, I hope you like graphs because that's what you're going to get a whole lot of uh, during this talk. Uh, what I've tried to do here is just compile some of what I think are the most interesting and relevant graphs to help you understand the contours of uh, the secular vote in 2020 and potentially what that could look like in 2024. Um, so let's get right to it, huh? So this is the share of Americans with no religious affiliation in the general social survey. Um, this is sort of the gold standard metric that we use to, let me turn my laser pointer, to uh, to track religion in America over a long period of time. Um, in 1972, about 5% of Americans were, were non-religious. Uh, there's a really funny paper written in 1968 calling them the neglected category. Uh, so uh, they were neglected in the 1970s because there just weren't that many of them. It was hard to study quantitatively because you, you didn't get that many of them in the sample. And then over the next um, 15, 20 years or so, the share of Americans who were nuns barely rose from 5% to about 6%, so not even statistically significant, even into the early 1990s. And then from that point forward, it's been nothing but a smooth and steady increase. I call this the hockey stick graph because it kind of looks like a hockey stick. Um, around 2000, it was about 14% of America. In 2014, it was 20% of America. And then in 2021, the number is 28%. And then you can see here that it actually dips a little bit. And, and that's um, consistent in a number of data sources now. The, the share of Americans who are non-religious has either plateaued or turned down a little bit. We don't really know why it's showing up consistently because um, it shouldn't, but it's continuing to show up. So um, if you look for all the different estimates of the share of Americans who are non-religious, you get huge variations, okay? You get an estimate like Gallup, which is as low as 21%. You get an estimate as high as the Cooperative Election Study, which puts it at 36%. And then in between 21 and 36, you've got all kinds of estimates that range from the low 20s to around 30%. What I tell people is that I think the share of Americans who are non-religious is probably about 30% of American adults right now. Um that's the number that Pew comes close to. The General Social Survey is pretty pretty close to that area as well. Um, it's definitely higher than 25, and it's probably lower than 35. So I think 30 is is my best guess at this. Obviously, there's no right answer to this question because how you ask the question and how many response options you provide gives a huge variation. Um, but I think 30% is probably um, the most empirically, academically defensible number for the share of Americans who are non-religious. So... But this is really, really important. When we talk about the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, we've got to make a clear distinction between the three types of nuns that Pew has created with their typology on their surveys, which is replicated across other instruments as well. So when we think of nuns, there's actually three types of nuns. There's atheists, there's agnostics, and there's nothing in particular. And those are th the last three options on the survey when you're asked the question, what is your present religion, if any? Um, you get Protestant and Catholic and Muslim and, and Latter-day Saint and Orthodox and Buddhist and Hindu. The last three are atheist, agnostic, and nothing in particular. So when I think about the nuns, I think about those three groups together. Um, obviously, probably many of you in the room would be in these red or blue colors here, the atheist or agnostic box. But most nuns are not atheist or agnostic and have never been atheist or agnostic. Most nuns are in that bottom category, that yellow group, which is nothing in particular. Today, about 23 or 24% of Americans say they're nothing in particular. 
compared to about 6% who identify as atheists and another 6% who identify as agnostic. So you put five nuns in a room, three of them are nothing in particular. One is an atheist and one's an agnostic. So probably, depending on what survey you look at, probably 60%, if not two-thirds of all nuns, are nothing in particular. I think they're probably the most important religious group and religious, quote-unquote, group in America today. They've gone from 14% to 24%, and they're really they're growing rapidly. So we're going to talk about them uh, a little more detail as we go along here. So um, this is the share of the population that is atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular by age. OK, so these are 18 year olds over here. These are 75 year olds over here. Um, I give you two estimates, the CES, which I think is probably an overestimate. And this impors is the Pew estimate. You can see here that amongst the youngest adult Americans. So between 18 and 22, the estimates for both surveys are very similar. OK, about 45, 47 percent of College age people today are nuns, atheist, agnostic, nothing in particular. Now, once you get out of that area, the estimates do diverge pretty significantly. Um, even you know, at 40 years old, Pew has it at 35 percent, CES has it at 42 percent. So you can see there's a gap here. Okay, um, which one's right? I'm not really sure. They're both estimates, um, but you can see that as age goes up the share of nuns goes down. That's consistent in both these surveys. So older people tend to be less likely to be nuns. Younger people tend to be more likely to be nuns. And what we know is that these people are going to age, obviously, and these people are going to replace these people as time progresses. It's called generational replacement. It's one of the key factors in religious demography. So let's get to votes then because um, we want to talk about politics here. So um, this is presidential vote choice among self-described atheists. Um, the farthest back I can go with this data is 2008. So Barack Obama's election against John McCain. And then obviously I can take you all the way up through um, the last four election cycles. So um, Romney, Obama, and then Clinton, Trump, and then Trump, Biden. So that's what we see here. Um, the atheist vote is reliably democratic, um, has been as far back as we can tell. So about 82% of atheists voted for, for um, Obama both times. Um, no real interesting change there. The, there was a little bit of a decline here, but I want you to point out that this number didn't change. So it's not like a lot of atheists became Republicans. What really happened was several of them voted for third-party candidates, and that's what you see over here on the right side. And then in 2020, we saw the atheist share for Biden rise all the way to 87% which is the highest it's ever been, as far as we know, and puts it on par with any other quote-unquote religious group. So Muslims are about 90% Biden voters. Black Protestants are about 90% Biden voters. So it puts atheists in that sort of same category. And then Trump only got 10% uh, of, of the atheist vote in 2020, which is the lowest it's been, as far as we can tell, in, uh, in the last four election cycles. So the atheist vote is very, very blue. And um, became much more blue between 2016 and 2020. Um, this is the agnostic vote. You see basically the same kind of thing here with a little bit of variation. Atheists are more democratic than agnostics are. Um, I always call them like diet atheists because they're like 5% less blue, 5% less liberal, sometimes 7% um, less liberal than, than atheists are. 80% in 2020 or 2008. 77% so uh, uh, Obama lost a little bit of ground here. And then in 2016, it dropped pretty significantly. Only 71% of agnostics voted for um, Hillary Clinton, and then 22% voted for Donald Trump amongst agnostics, which was a pretty significant rise here. But then in 2020, we basically see a return to the Obama 2008 coalition. 80% of agnostics voted for the Democrat, about 17 18% voted for the Republican. So what you kind of consistently you're seeing here is that 2016 was an aberration, um, and then 2020 looked a whole lot like 2008, so a return to um, normal is what I would, would call it. Now, the last category is the nothing in particulars, okay? Now, nothing in particulars are less blue than both atheists and agnostics. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll show you what they look like politically here in a second, but they are less 
they are not nearly as bound to the Democratic Party as atheist agnostics are. 71% for Obama in 2008, dropped only 65% in his reelection bid in 12. And then look, I think this is really, really important. This is 2016 number right here. Um, Clinton only got 55% of the nothing in particular vote. So she did 10 points worse than Obama did um, in his reelection bid. And Trump got 38%. So the gap here is only 17. Okay. Here it was 33, and then it dropped to 17 points. So it halved between 2012 and 2016. But then if, again, if you look at 2020, you sort of see a return to form. So 2020 looks almost exactly like 2012 amongst nothing in particulars. They sort of came back to their senses, I guess, and realized, hey, a lot of us are Democrats. My whole theory of this, by the way, is that Trump was an outsider, campaign is an outsider, saying no one's looking out for you. Uh, a lot of nothing in particular feel like no one's looking out for them. They wanted a guy who was going to shake up Washington and drain the swamp and all those things. They really don't like institutions, and so they like Trump. Some of them like Trump because he was an anti-institutionalist, and they went to his, you know, his camp. And then after a couple years of him in office, they realized he's just like every other politician, and they sort of went back to their normal situation, which is two thirds of them are Democrats and and one third are Republicans. So, um. Okay, so this is a. I know this is probably not, not going to work on a on a big screen, but I wanted to show you like the last four election cycles a bunch a, a bunch of different religious groups. Um, this is the share for the Republican in the last four elections, and so you know the blue the blue circle is two thousand eight, the triangle is twelve, the square is sixteen, and the cross is twenty twenty. The one thing I wanted to point out to all of you here is how little these numbers move over time. I mean, if you look at white evangelicals, they're right here. It was within three percentage points in the last four elections. Um, mainline Protestants are here. Non-white evangelicals are here. It's very rare for these percentages to move significantly over the last four election cycles. Religion and politics is very static. Like, look at the white Catholic vote. I mean, that's all within the margin of error for the Republican over the last four election cycle. They're moving slightly to the right, but by a point or two. Um, so... It's very rare to see a religious group go from being like 65% Democrat to 45% Democrat or vice versa. That that just does not happen. The, the only outliers here are smaller groups. For instance, the LDS vote, the LDS were not in love with Donald Trump in 2016. Um, only 55% of Latter-day Saints voted for him in 2016 when it's usually about 75%. So big movement there. Um, and then, you know, like Orthodox is a really small group. But if you look at a lot of these other groups— the movement is just not that big. Um, so what that tells us is it's it's really not – religious people don't change their minds on things. Um, they don't change how they're going to vote. What happens over time is it becomes something about turnout, uh, people moving around the religious landscape. That's probably driving more of the changes that we're seeing than actual – you know, like white evangelicals being like we don't like Trump or atheists being like, well, we don't like Obama or Biden. Um, we really just don't see a whole lot of movement inside groups uh, over election cycles. So – if we were going to plot all these religious groups in um, ideological space, so this is very liberal in the bottom and very conservative in the top, and then this is partisanship across the left and right. So obviously very far – the left side of this graph is strong Democrats, and the right side of this graph is strong Republicans. So up here you've got conservative Republicans. Down here you've got liberal Democrats. Obviously you can see it's a – the correlation goes that way, which makes sense. Um, the entire sample is right here, by the way. So literally like almost smack in the middle of ideology and partisanship is where you find the average American, white evangelicals, and Mormons are in the top right corner, which I don't think comes as a surprise to anybody. But our nothing in particulars are here, so slightly on the conservative side of ideology, but then slightly left of center on partisanship. So I would call them slightly conservative, slightly Democrats, which in some ways doesn't make any sense, but in some ways does because partisanship and ideology are not exactly equivalent to each other. Now, on the bottom left here, you can see our atheists. Atheists are a group that is the most liberal, okay? Liberals down this way. They're more liberal than any other quote-unquote religious group, followed by agnostics, and then Jews are right next to them. OK, so atheists, the corollary to white evangelicals is atheists. Okay, they're here. They're here. Now, one thing I didn't want to point out is look at where black Protestants are. Black Protestants are actually more democratic than atheists are 
but they're actually right of center on ideology. So when people call black Protestants liberals, that is absolutely empirically false. They are moderate Democrats. Atheists are liberal Democrats. So it kind of shows you how partisanship and ideology are not exactly the same thing. Atheists are liberal Democrats. Agnostics are slightly less. And then nothing in particular is sort of this weird mishmash of slightly conservative but slightly left of center when it comes to partisanship. Okay, I love this graph um, because what it's doing is it's asking everyone to place the Democrats, which are in the blue, themselves, which are in the black, Trump in the purple and the Republican Party in ideological space between very liberal, which would be a one, and very conservative, which is a seven. Okay, so these are atheists. In 2016, the average atheist saw themselves at the exact same ideological spot as the Democratic Party. All right, there's no difference between the average atheist and the average Democrat. But look what's happened over the last six or seven years. The average atheist sees themselves as moving to the left towards the liberal side of the political spectrum, and look what they see the Democrats are doing. They believe the Democratic Party is becoming more moderate over time. So now there's a gap forming. By the way, there's no group in America that sees themselves to the left of the Democrats except for atheists. Even yeah. white evangelicals don't see themselves to the right of the Republicans. They see themselves exactly on top of the Republican Party. And then you can see where they put the, the Republicans. They score the Republicans at 6.5 out of 7. So 7 would be as conservative as you get. The average score is 6.5. They put Trump in that same spot too, by the way. Uh, right on that 6.5 number. Agnostics are more moderate, as you can see here. They're to, more towards the middle of this graph, although they've moved to the left. They see the Democrats as also moving to the right slowly over time. So now the average agnostic sees themselves pretty close to the average Democrat. Okay, And then nothing in particular are a totally different graph. They see the Democrats both moving slightly to the left, and then they see themselves moving slightly to the left over time. Okay, So – there's a completely – these three different groups see the political uh, landscape completely differently than each other. So they see the Democrats as – and by the way, look at this too. Atheists see the Republicans as more conservative than agnostics, and agnostics see the Republicans as more conservative than nothing in particulars. So atheists see a huge gap, bigger gap between them and the Republican Party than any other religious group. So – where and how does this matter? This is um, political activity. Okay. The question was in the prior twelve uh, in the in the in the prior month, have you engaged in any of the following behaviors? Attend a meeting, put up a sign, work on a campaign, attend a protest or march, contact a public official, or donate money. These are all the nuns. And then I showed you what the entire sample. You can see here that eleven percent of atheists attended a political. This is twenty twenty. Attended a political meeting. It was only 8% of the entire sample. 27% of atheists put up a yard sign, political yard sign or a bumper sticker. It was only 19% of the entire sample. Atheists are more likely to work on a campaign than the entire sample. They're twice as likely to attend a protest or march. They're 15, 14 points more likely to contact a public official, and they're almost twice as likely to donate money to a candidate or campaign compared to the general public. Half of atheists gave money to a candidate or campaign in 2020, in the overall sample, it was 28%. So atheists are, are, are far outpacing the average American when it comes to all these political actions, whether it be something so mild as putting up a bumper sticker or something so you know um, labor-intensive like working on a campaign, volunteering. They're much more engaged in the political process than other groups. And so what I did was I took all six of those acts and I added them together. And this is the average number of political acts engaged in amongst all these religious groups. So zero would mean none. Six would mean I participated in all six of those acts I just showed you in the prior graph. The least active are black Protestants. The average black Protestant engages in about 0.55 acts out of six um, non-white Catholics. And nothing in particular are very low on this metric too, about 0.7 or so. You can go up the graph. Um, white evangelicals, by the way, are right here at about 0.85 or so, so right in the sort of middle of the distribution. Then there's a gap, mainline, Buddhist, agnostic are here, and then you see Jews are here at about 1.4 or so, 
and atheists are here. Atheists are score about 1.55 on this metric. Atheists are, from this metric, the most politically active, quote-unquote, religious group in America today. No one participates in politics more than atheists do, more, much more than any other. The only group that even comes close to them are Jews, uh, and they're just slightly lower statistically. It's not significant, but really it's atheists and Jews and then everybody else. No one engages in politics more than atheists do. And, you know, I did this whole thing, and someone said, yeah, but it's because atheists have higher incomes and higher education than other groups. And I said, well, let me just test. So I ran a regression model, and this is the mean number. This is um, – so education is down here on the bottom. The This blue bar, purple bar here are atheists. You can see high school-educated atheists are more engaged than any other religious group. Amongst some college, atheists are more engaged. Amongst those with a two-year degree, atheists are more engaged. Among those with a four-year degree, atheists are more engaged. Among those with a postgraduate degree, atheists are more engaged. So if you compare apples to apples, so you control for age, education, race, um, income, gender, a a atheists come out on top every single time. The only one that comes close, again, is Jewish people. No other group is even in the same ballpark as atheists. So even an atheist with a high school diploma is more engaged than someone else with a high school diploma. Um, they are easily the most politically engaged um, group in America today. And and here's where it gets fascinating. So I looked at the percentage of the sample who was white evangelical and then donated to a candidate campaign in 2020. So 4.7% of all Americans in 2020 were white evangelicals who donated to a candidate campaign. 3.1% were atheists who donated to a candidate or campaign. So even though atheists are a smaller number in terms of raw numbers, when it comes to donations, the gap is only one and a half percentage points because white evangelicals donate at a much lower rate than atheists do. So I think there's a real possibility in the next 10, 15 years that the number of Americans who are atheists who do donate to campaigns will be higher than the number of white evangelicals who donate to candidates or campaigns. So that gap is closing very rapidly um, because atheists are so politically engaged and they're growing as, as a share of the population. So um, what do the parties look like right now? This is the religious composition of the Republican coalition, okay? 38% of all Republicans today are white evangelicals. That was an increase from 34% in 2008. Um, ca white Catholics are down six points. Mainline are down six points. The share of the Republican coalition that are nuns is right here on the bottom. 2% atheist, 2% agnostic, 12% nothing in particular. So about 16% of all Republicans are are non-religious today. That's up from 11% in 2008. So 11% to 16% over the last 12 years, four election cycles, 11% to 16%. Now, let's look at the at the Democratic coalition. So um, the Democratic coalition now, it used to be 7% atheist, 9% agnostic, and 19% nothing in particular. So about 35% uh, of Obama's voters were atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. Okay, So 19 plus 9 plus 7. Now, if you look at the Democratic coalition in 2020, the Biden coalition, 13% were atheists, almost a doubling. The agnostic share basically did not change, and then the nothing in particular share went from 19% to 22%. So now the coalition, the Democratic coalition, is about 45% non-religious today, atheist, agnostic, nothing in particular. Amongst the Republicans, it's 15%. So 15% of Republicans are nuns. It's 45% of Democrats. I think it's very likely that maybe in 2024 or, or 2028 – Half of all voters for the Democratic Party are going to be non-religious. Um, it's it's the mo one of the most significant shifts in American politics, and I don't think the politicians are fully uh, aware of how fast things have changed uh, on this metric. So um, some, some things that Pew released, that this is not my data, this is Pew data. This is about um, are nuns more or less civically engaged than um, religiously affiliated people? So – here, this is, did you volunteer in the last year in your community? 
21% of atheists said yes, 22% of agnostics, only 15% of nothing in particulars, compared to 27% of religiously affiliated people. So um, in this metric, the nuns are less uh, inclined to volunteer. But on other metrics, they're just as inclined. This is the one I really wanted to point out. This is, did you vote in the 2022 midterms? Half of atheists said yes. 49% of agnostics said yes. Amongst the religiously affiliated group, it's 51%. So these numbers are basically the same. About 50% of these people engaged. But look at the nothing in particulars. Only 32% of them said they voted in the 2022 midterms. So even though this group is very large and it's growing, they're not nearly as politically engaged as atheists and agnostics are who are smaller but much more politically involved. So it's it's sort of a mixed bag when it comes to you know volunteerism and civic participation. In some ways, atheist agnostics are very, very high, but then on, on things like volunteering, they're a bit lower. Um, and this is, you know, have you volunteered in the past 12 months? This is broken down by all kinds of different metrics. I just want to throw it up here quick. 21% of atheists, 22% of agnostics, only 15% of nothing in particulars um, said they volunteered. The most, the group that's most likely among the nuns to volunteer are those with college degrees. The least likely are those with high school diplomas. So I think there's a strong education component to this. Educated nuns are more engaged. Uneducated nuns, less educated nuns are less engaged. And we see that across all kinds of metrics, by the way. Education is um, very indicative of how much you engage in the, in, the, in the political process, but also how much you just volunteer in the community. Now, the question is, why do atheists volunteer less? I wanted to point out this paper that was just published uh, a couple months ago where these two scholars, uh, David Speed and Penny Eggdale, asked that question. Why do atheists tend to score lower on volunteer metrics? And they use data from Canada to try to understand why. Um, and I really want to point you to this last sentence in their abstract, which I'll read to you. The results suggest that atheists likely have fewer opportunities to volunteer, but are similarly inclined to volunteer. So really, it's not that atheists are just less – they don't want to volunteer. It's just they don't have the scaffolding, the infrastructure that makes it easy to volunteer like, like a religious organization would. So it's not, you know, atheists are just not, they, not like they don't care about the community. It's just it's harder for them to volunteer, and therefore they volunteer less. So that's something to keep in mind. It's not a, it's not a mindset or a mentality. It's just um, logistics probably matter as much, if not more, in this conversation than anything else. Um, I feel like I've talked a lot and shown you a lot of graphs. I'll put all this up here, um, the books that I've written. You can follow me on Twitter up here. It's still Twitter to me. It's never going to be X. I also have a substat called Graphs About Religion. Um, you can follow me there. I post twice a week on uh, Mondays and Thursdays. So uh, I guess I'll stop now and open it up to the floor for questions or comments or whatever you have. Thank you, Ryan, very much. That was terrific. And um, I'm hoping you can hear me because we do have a hand up with the question. Or, yeah. yeah. I'm wondering about the nothing in particular. How mm -hmm. many might really be atheists? Just totally, they don't like the atheist word. And it had been uh, phrases, do you believe in any gods? A lot of those nothing in particular would say no. Mm -hmm. So and this is, yeah. When you have a Jew, I'm a Jewish atheist. I think there are a lot of them. I wonder if people are allowed to answer Jew and atheist around the way. Or was it just one category they had to respond? So that's, that's a great question. We think about religion on three dimensions, behavior, belief, and belonging. Okay. So behavior is like how much do I go to a house of worship? That's typically the metric we use there. Belonging is the one that I use for this, which is what is your present religion of any, and you're given all those options from Protestant to Catholic to nothing in particular. And then the third uh, the dimension is what we call belief metrics, which is like what do you believe about God or the Bible or supernatural things or you know angels and demons and those kind of things. Um, unfortunately, most surveys that work in this area only ask the question about belonging and behavior. They don't ask about belief. Um we do know that there's a disconnect between the belief metrics and the belonging metrics, which this sounds bizarre, but if you ask people, what are you? 
um, you know, amongst people who say they're atheists, then we ask them what do they believe about God. Only 70% of those people then say God doesn't exist. So, you know, some people say I'm an atheist by social category, but I'm not atheist by religious belief. If you look at people who never attend religious services, never attend religious services, about 20% of them say that God exists and I have no doubt about it. And 20% say God does not exist. So there's a lot of these categories don't lay on top each other very well sometimes. I think the belonging metric for me matters the most because if you look at the data, there's more animus against atheists than almost any other group in America. There's more animosity. So about 10 years ago, Pew asked this really interesting question, which says, would you be upset if someone uh, of your close family married someone of this different group? And about half of people said they would be upset if someone in their family married an atheist. Um, only 7% would have been upset if someone in their family married an evangelical. So, you know, that's 10 years ago. I think the number has gone down. I don't know how much, but it's there's still a lot of animosity towards atheism. And so I think when someone says they're atheist on a survey, they're really saying, you know, I don't care about all that negative blowback. I'm an atheist loud and proud. So I think people who select that on surveys are really making a declarative point about who they how they belong and who they see themselves with socially. So um, we don't really have – I try to like I've, – I've written posts about secular Jews before. It's really hard to sort of parse out what that means. You know, like there are a lot of Jewish people who say religion is not very important to them. But they still go to – you know, they still go to the Passover services. So in some ways they're very – you know, they're not religious. In some ways they are religious. Um, that's what makes measuring this stuff so hard is there's no right answer. There's no single way to do it. Thank you. Um, I just want to verify what that last statement in our community, we have, uh, we have, I can think of three really big examples where we were kicked out of volunteer opportunities because we were atheists. Whole groups, our Oasis group got kicked out of helping the Salvation Army even after they let us volunteer for two years. Their third year, they decided we're atheists, we can't do it anymore. St. Patrick's Day, they kicked us out of the parade because we we're atheists. And the second thing is, our volunteers that come to us from come from religion, which is not just in Kansas City. They tell us all the time, I tried volunteering, but I got to deal with a damn ch uh, church uh, or prayers during volunteer or a cross is there. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why a person wouldn't be able to actively volunteer without feeling like they're, um, you know, they're not part of that. Yeah. Ron, and I think the, the data comports with that, by the way. Atheists are just as inclined to volunteer. They just don't have the the means to do so. And uh, there's tons of evidence in the data that just giving people opportunities to donate money are more likely to donate money. Giving people more opportunities to volunteer, they're more likely to volunteer. It's it's really that simple. I don't think, I mean, the data is clear on this. It's, it's not an inclination thing. Um, it's just an opportunity thing. And, um, you know, I'm sorry that happened to you. Um, but I don't, I mean, I don't know how to take that any farther. <laughs> I really do appreciate all the great work that you've done studying the atheist humanist. Yeah. Um, but some of your early work, I get the impression that you don't think that this is really a good thing for the nation. Um, the growth of the nuns and atheists, and sort of like globalism, we can't stop it. We do it. I was wondering, hopefully, that as you've been meeting more of our community, making presentations, and knowing what values we have, mm -hmm. has that changed? So I don't think that uh, America becoming more secular is is a good or bad thing. I'm really value neutral on that. Um, I, I I think it's here's here's my my bigger worry is that we've become more more sorted out and more cloistered than ever before. Um, you know, I just showed you a bunch of data on atheists, and they're 85 percent Democrats. Um, if I showed you data on white evangelicals, they'd be 85 percent Republicans. I don't think either of those things is good because what what I think holds us together as a democracy is when we can mix and mingle with people who are different than us. And I'm all for spaces that generate discussion amongst diversity. And I mean racial diversity, economic diversity, political diversity. If we are going to survive as a democracy, it has to be predicated on compromise. And I think what we're seeing, and this is, I think Christians are just as guilty of this as any other group, is they've managed to kick out anyone they disagree with and have become all of one note. And because of that now, what we do is 
Christians create the worst version of atheists in their minds and then hate that version of it. And atheists do the same thing of Christians. And I think both are uncharitable to each other. So I am not I I I I am value agnostic when it comes to the rise of secularization. Like if, if that if that works for you, that's total that's obviously not my perspective. Your perspective is different. However, I think from a social science perspective, I think we we are a better country when we are mixed ideologically. And I'm writing a book now called The Big Church Sort. And basically the thesis of that book is we talk a lot about political polarization. We don't talk a lot about religious polarization. Um, in the future, what you're going to have is a very a small number of very religiously fervent people on one side, like evangelicals, but also Latter Day Saints and traditional Catholics and Muslims on one side of the political spectrum. And on the other side, you're going to have a whole bunch of nuns, and in the middle, you're going to have nothing. And I think that's bad. I think that's inherently bad for a country who's trying to build bridges across the political divide. And I think for democracy to continue. We need to stop seeing the other side as enemies of democracy and seeing them as different people. And one, the one way we know that is through social contact theory. The more you interact with people who are different than you, the more tolerance you have of those groups. And that doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but it also doesn't mean you think they're, they're, they're sitting in this country you know, in, careening into the abyss. And so that is I, – I would be happy – I don't care if we get 70 percent nuns, if we can mix and match. In these diverse spaces, that is all that matters to me. Religion used to provide that. It is not providing that anymore, and I want something to step into that void and create that diversity. And that's sort of why I wanted to talk about values, because it's about we work with a lot of religious groups because we share values on reproductive rights, civil rights, you know, and you know, I, the dualism that often comes up, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's just the atheists against the white Christian nationalists. But there are distinctions, like not storming the capital. <laughs> I think there is a difference between the two bots. So when say to recruit, we have this polarism, polarizing, but we do work with folks and we do share values. Me and Lori. Here I am. Can you tell me something about, or ask something about the young nuns and nothing in particular who tend not to vote, and whether there's any research in what might get them to vote and be more engaged? Great, great. This is something that I really want to drive home this point is. You guys have a great group there. There's there's tons of great groups on the atheist side, right? There's the American Separation, uh, American United for Separation of Church and State, Freedom from Religion Foundation, the American Atheists, uh, the Secular Coalition. I can go down the list. There's all these tons of really good groups that help organize atheists and agnostics primarily. There is no group in America for the nothing in particulars. No one advocates for them, and they're one quarter of America. And there's a reason no one advocates for them because they don't want to be part of anything. Um, if you look at the data, that's what you see. You know, there's no president of the nothing in particular because they'd be like, we're not going to have a vote. We don't have an organization. <laughs> you know, if, if you look at the data, they're not engaging in education. They have the lowest level of education. Only 25% of them have a four-year college degree. It's 50% of atheists. It's 46% of agnostics, okay? If you look at those, those um, political activity metrics I just showed you, you know who scores the lowest on those? Nothing in particulars. Only one-third of nothing in particulars engaged in the political process in 2022. It was 50% of atheists. So there's these, you see this picture emerging of a group of Americans who have rejected every institution in American life, education, politics, religion. I mean they basically cut themselves off from a lot of the structures that give us meaning and purpose. And I, by the way, I think politics can give us meaning and purpose. I think social events give us meaning and purpose. I think education gives us meaning and purpose. And, they're, and religion does too for some people. They're cutting themselves off from all of those things. And from a social science perspective, that is terrifying. Because what they're saying, there's a, there's a, a new theory in political science. I'll just roll it out in the room for a second. It's called agents of chaos. These are people who just want to see the entire system burn down. They don't care what comes up from the ashes. They just want to see it all go away because they think it's not working anymore. So that's why they kind of like a guy like Donald Trump because he's a burn it down kind of guy. That I think that's a lot of nothing in particulars. I think they have to be seen. They have to be believed. They have to understand. I think for a lot of them what's happened is they were – they're casualties of globalization 
many of them. They wanted to live the same life their parents and grandparents lived, which is go get a high school diploma, go work in the local factory, make a decent middle-class wage, buy a home, go on vacation. They tried that same path their parents and grandparents did, and it does not work for them. And they're very angry about that. They're the first generation in American history who has it worse than their parents and grandparents did. And the system is not working for them. We got to find ways to integrate them back into society in some form or fashion, right? Whether it be, you know, democracy or whether it be religion or whether it be some social group in your community, they need connection with something because we know that you are not built to be in isolation. That is not the human condition. And yet they're isolating themselves. And so I think we've got to find those people. And we've got, and I tell this to my, you know, to people all the time, cynicism is the most prevailing emotion amongst young people in America today. Cynicism. There's a huge difference between skepticism and cynicism. And I think cynicism is a cancer on American society. Not everyone is out to make money or take advantage of you. They're really trying to make the world a better place. A lot of people are. And yet young people cannot believe that. And I think that's a real problem. And I think we've got to find ways to fight that, educate these young people in a different way and saying that it's just, institutions can be good. They built America and they can continue to build America. So. <laughs> Thank you. Something we see as people age is that their um, their political affiliations may change over time. Um, you know, when white women get married, they tend to get more conservative. And I guess I'm curious if you have thoughts about the long term demographic trend. You see, you know, these really high numbers of young people in all three atheists, agnostic, and nuns. If you see that changing over time as they that's a great – so here's a good point. People think that it's it's um, people become more religious as they age. Actually, the data says people are becoming less religious as they age now. Um, if you look at – like compare like people born in the 1950s in 2008 to now, they're 5% more likely to be nuns now than they were in 2008. So it's not just a young person thing. It's actually like across the board. Everyone is becoming um, less religious today than they were you know, 10, 15 years ago. So we know that certain life courses, life events tend to – push people to the right things like marriage and, and, and becoming parents are two events that mm. now the problem with that though is were you already more conservative which led you to get married and have kids or was getting married and having kids the sort of nudge that pushed you to the right side hard to disentangle that causal chain right because it's it's we don't sometimes we don't even know like we can't even you know articulate ourselves what's happening in our heads when we do those things so, but I, what I do think is happening is politics has hardened us even more because of polarization. So I think we're seeing less switching now. People are not changing their partisanship over the life course like they did 30 or 40 years ago because the parties are seen as so starkly different now than they were 30 or 40. I remember when I was like in 2000, the big knock was, oh, the Republicans, the Democrats are all the same. I don't hear that, that emotion uh, expressed a whole lot anymore. And so when the Democrats are so far away from the Republicans and vice versa, it's a big leap to go from one party to the other. So I actually think what we're seeing is the hardening and even these life events like getting married, having kids, getting a job, getting in a higher income bracket. I don't think those things are going to move people's partisanship as much as they did 20 or 30 years ago. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Birch, for your time this morning. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and uh, thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate you.